Okay. So, so why don't we get going? I apologize to our audience in advance. It will get better from here. I promise. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today for our panel. It's uh, entitled Unlocking Intelligence, Education Within Technology and Virtual Worlds, VR, AR, Immersive. We have a great group of panelists today. Um, and what I'm going to do is let them introduce themselves and just talk one or two minutes about who they are and what they do and how it relates to this topic. Then I, I have uh, a handful of questions that we'll use as the basis of discussion. And we'd like to make it interactive. It's great. Um, we'd like to make it interactive. So if you do have a question, we will leave time at the end. But you can also raise your hand during the panel. And now I can actually make a really corny joke, which is, here comes the sun. My <laughs> name is Sun Jen Young. <laughs> that wasn't planned. Um, and I'm, uh, uh, as moderator, uh, my, my, my real day job is I'm an investment banker with a mid-market investment banking firm called Headwaters MB. We have about 100 bankers here in the US spread across six offices. I'm uh, in the New York metropolitan area office, and I run the digital media and internet practice. And we do mergers and acquisitions advisory. So we help companies sell themselves and others uh, buy uh, other companies. And we raise uh, private equity capital and some debt capital. And just in terms of a couple of deals that I've done this year, uh, I sold FYI Television to Ericsson uh, in the beginning of the year. And then I sold a music rights company called MediaNet, which is um, actually based on the West Coast between uh, Seattle and Los Angeles to SOCAN, the Canadian Performing Rights Organization. So with that, let me just uh, quickly run through who we have on our panel today, and then I'll let them do their own introductions. So to my right, we have Lynn Rogoff, who's the founder of AmeriKids USA. And next to Lynn is Ty Crosby, who's the founder and CEO of SilverThread. And then uh, Skip Rizzo it is a PhD, and he's the director uh, uh, of medical virtual reality for the Institute for Creative Technologies at USC. Sitting next to Skip is Ariella Lair, who's also a PhD. That's why we have them sitting next to each other. And she's the CEO and president for Legacy Interactive and Legacy Games. And uh, following Ariella is Eric Gradman, who's chief technology officer for Two Bit Circus. Not and a PhD. Not, not PhD, but you do get you do have the best haircut. And then Eddie Offerman has the longest title: virtual and augmented reality researcher and pipeline architect for Murata Studios. So with that, um, Lynn, do you want to kick it off? OK. Well, we at AmeriKids are doing uh, VR and mobile games to find and save endangered animals worldwide. And we've identified the problem as being critical issue that is facing our planet today, that climate change and habitat loss and overpopulation of the human species has, and their uh, activities have caused animals on our planet to be suffering greatly, and their species dwindling materially. And so we've decided that we could make this fun to learn about and get involved in and uh, make proactive activity by players to get find so each other socially and do something about this issue. So our first game is about finding and saving the endangered elephant in the savannas of Africa. And we've done games of, on the tablet for the pandas in southwest China and uh, the California condor. And we did this, we started out originally doing this for the web, and then we moved into VR. Ty? So my name is Ty Crosby, good to meet you. I'm the founder and CEO of SilverThread. At SilverThread, we started with a vision two and a half years ago of what is it like to capture the human experience and replay that for somebody else? How do we make it so that you can quite literally walk in somebody else's shoes? And so using cinematic 3D VR, we're actually able to capture full 360, full 3D stereopsky, utilizing in-body technology. So what this does is it allows you to capture somebody's human experience and then transfer that memory to somebody else and they can play it back as if they were that person. 
and we've done this for a number of things within education, both for hard skills training, specific technical training, as well as soft skills training, such as how do you go through a boardroom experience when all of a sudden you're presented with a hostile board? Or what do you do if you're a doctor walking into the room and you're trying to deal with somebody and English is their second language, but how do you work with them in this situation beyond just clinical trials? And we believe it's all about accelerating the time to competency and using this as a tool, technology as a tool for educators to do a better job. Skip. Okay, um, I direct the medical VR lab at USC and we started back in 1996, right at the uh, start of the first nuclear winter of virtual reality. Uh, there was a lot of excitement back in the day, uh, in the early 90s about VR, much like there is today, but the big difference is, is that the technology wasn't uh, really there back then to deliver on the vision. Um, our work focuses uh, the full spectrum of clinical applications for VR, whether it's psychological treatment for PTSD or working with people with high-functioning autism to help them develop social skills using VR for surviving a job interview or cognitive assessment uh, with kids with attention deficit disorder, to put them in a virtual classroom and measure how well they can maintain their attention under a range of systematically controllable distracting conditions, um, physical therapy and occupational therapy after a stroke or traumatic brain injury by putting people in game-like contexts where their physical movement is being tracked and uh, instead of doing a very boring and repetitive rehab task, you know, moving their arm a certain way, they can do it and have it actuate some something in a game, make it fun and engaging so maybe they do the rehab more. And finally, uh, we've done a lot of work with um, artificially intelligent virtual human agents, either as virtual patients for training novice clinicians, better clinical skills, or as healthcare support agents to help people that don't want to go see a live provider initially, like service members and veterans who are very loath to seek clinical care. Uh, for mental health problems, but they can interact privately with this character and learn about PTSD and TBI. Um, and uh, generally, uh, the, our viewpoint is that uh, just as an aircraft simulator serves to test and train piloting ability under a range of controllable conditions, we use VR in similar fashion to test, train, teach, and treat human functioning across a wide range of clinical and sometimes non-clinical conditions. Ariella. Hi, I'm Ariella Lehrer and uh, CEO of Legacy Interactive and Legacy Games. I've been making games for more than 30 years, have a PhD in cognitive psychology, so I'm particularly interested in kids and also spent a long many years making games for women. Um, mostly our company is known for taking Hollywood types of brands like Law & Order, ER, um, Criminal Minds, uh, just launched a game with Tarzan. Um, but relevant to this panel, what we're doing is currently working with Google on a project called Crayola Color Blaster. And this is for the new technology called Tango that is actually launching October 28th. And we're one of three titles that will be uh, featured at the launch in San Francisco. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Tango, it's the first device to come out is by Lenovo. It's a flablet, so a combination tablet phone. It has two 3D cameras on the back as well as infrared sensor, as well as all the other sensors that and cameras that normally come with a phone. And this allows you then with this device to be really sensitive to the, it's a world sensing camera. So it knows where the you know, furniture is, it knows where the people are standing. So you can imagine that the types of augmented reality experiences that you can have using this device now are quite different because it's so much more intelligent about wayfinding and about the world around you. So our particular game that's coming out allows you to chase a virtual, <laughs> the first version of it is with zombies, of course, and allows you to chase zombies, zombies chase you, there's some 
uh, other characters involved as well, dragons and fairies, and you're coloring them uh, in order to stop them from stealing your color. It's a combination tag and hide and go seek in the real world. It's a lot of fun. Eric? Hey everybody, my name is Eric Gradman. I am, my official title is Mad Inventor at Two Bit Circus, and we are a high tech circus out of downtown Los Angeles. And, you know, right now we're doing a great deal of stuff in VR. I think as a company, as new technologies have been introduced, we've found ways to make them fun and in many cases educational and inspiring for kids. Uh, so right now we have a, a, a very uh, fully featured VR production studio and we're doing a lot of uh, sports capture and haptic playback and uh, building a lot of uh, live, uh, live and not live 360 capture and playback systems. But I think what's more relevant to this panel is a project that we've been doing for the last couple of years called the Steam Carnival. And in the Steam Carnival, it's basically a traveling carnival of high-tech entertainment, all of which is designed to inspire kids to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And so what we've done is we've created all sorts of fun interactive games and uh, basically carnival games that you know and love from being a kid, but we've, we've torn them apart. We've replaced all the insides with VR and Arduinos and fabrication technologies. And we pull back the curtain on all of these things we've built and use that as a way of inspiring kids to pursue these careers in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Now, for that, augmented reality, virtual reality, and immersive technologies are a key component of that because we're using whatever we can to show kids what kind of possibilities there are if they love engineering. Another thing we've been spending a lot of time in is what we call story rooms. And story rooms are highly immersive environments. We, we will bring a room to life with technology. We will put monitors on the walls. We'll build consoles that look like they, came, they were ripped right out of a spaceship cockpit. Uh, large multi-person interactive surfaces all around the room. All of these devices are choreographed and synchronized with one another. So a group of people can walk into this environment and have a shared fun experience. And we see VR and AR as being a huge part of those types of experiences. And we've built a couple now and they are a ton of fun. We don't use AR and VR as ends to themselves, but as parts of a larger immersive experience that can bring people together in ways they're just not going to encounter anywhere else. That's what we do. Finally, Eddie. Hi, I'm Eddie Offerman, and uh, I work at uh, Murata Studio. Murata Studio is a, uh, it's a production studio that was formed out of a, a former uh, motion graphics and animation house called Motion Theory. The, uh, the uh, the owners of that merged with uh, Guillermo del Toro and Guillermo de Navarro to form Motion Theory, which they call a studio for storytellers. Uh, basically, our, uh, our mission is telling stories, communicating ideas, uh, communicating emotions through the use of technology. And my particular uh, role there is uh, sort of one of those, those uh, jobs that I, I think most people think don't, don't exist, and for the most part, they don't. But uh, I basically spend probably 90% of my time in self-directed, arbitrary R&D with any new piece of technology we can get our hands on. Um, whether it's spatial sensing, whether it's a HoloLens, whether it's Tango, we are doing the, one of the other launch titles for, uh, for Tango is us. Um, so basically that's, that's my thing, is looking at these technologies, finding out what kinds of data we're able to get from different types of spatial sensors. Um, what are the new uh, what are the new input paradigms? How are people supposed to interact with uh, with some of these new technologies? You know, if you're wearing a Hololens, what uh, you know? How do you actually request specific types of information uh, in in what is a really revolutionary way of approaching uh, information and computing? And uh, so, so yeah, that's me. So thank you. We have, um, I think, a great group, uh, incredibly brainy um, as well. So just to get a gauge of who's in the audience so that we can tune our conversation, how many of you are in the area of AR or VR or immersive? Just raise your hands. OK. How many are developers? How many are on the business side, sales and marketing? Entrepreneurs, 
And how many have already gotten a pair of the Sony glasses? <laughs> okay. How many play Pokemon Go? Okay, that's a good representation. How many of you are playing Pokemon Go right now? <laughs> <laughs> how many of you are a Pokemon? <laughs> So uh, just to start it out here, since the topic of our conversation is supposed to be about education, how are you all on the panel thinking about education in this context? And I would add to that, since we're opening up uh, definitions briefly, um, you know, we, we're throwing around VR, AR, immersive, they're all very different but related. How do each of you see you know, AR, VR, and immersive in the context of this conversation? Who, who, do you want to go I could start. first, Lynn? I looked up the w definition of the word to educate and because I knew we were going to talk about it. And the dictionary combo, various dictionaries say that it's to inform or, or enlighten and to, or to develop mental, moral, or social capacities. So it's a very broad concept of what the word educate means. It doesn't mean the classroom, and it doesn't mean a higher education or lower education. It means mental, moral, social capacities to inform and enlighten and develop them. So I think, in my case, I think that we're, we're in the edutainment business, which is to encourage all people not just the classroom or the students, but to, we all like to learn about various subjects. And I don't think learning is something that you just do in the classroom. And I think that if we could take something like a game and make it something that you learn and you are able to act on and it, through this immersive experience of VR, uh, that you will be an engaged citizen in the world. And I think that people want to feel that way. And that's what I believe education is all about, that it allows you to be a citizen of the world. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll jump in. I, I, have, uh, I am a poor educator, and I have never intentionally educated anyone in my life. What I try and do is inspire kids to use the tools at their disposal to make things. I'm an engineer, and a lot of the people who work with me are engineers, and we've used these technologies to give kids the tools they need to feel comfortable making stuff, turn them into developers, turn them into fabricators, give them uh, a sense that, you know, the, the, the pursuit of how to solve the problem you may have at hand is the most fun undertaking. And so, uh, using AR and VR and immersive, we're trying to give kids the sense that they can build all of this stuff themselves. I'm not trying to, I mean, there, there are so many valuable ways, and I, you're, you're all going to talk about the amazing ways that VR and AR in and of themselves can be used to impart knowledge. What I'm trying to do is use these technologies to let kids know that they can build the stuff themselves. That's great. Um, so what do you all see as the most compelling uses today? for VR and AR and immersive? Well, I, uh, um, I, I taught at the university level for about four and a half years, and uh, probably the first thing that I noticed about myself uh, about a week into doing that was how much I hated lecturing, um, how much I absolutely despised the process of standing up there with a prepared outline and just kind of checking off the notes and going through communicating to a room full of bored college students some uh, uh, only occasionally inspiring information, but necessary stuff that everybody needed to know. And so the next thing that I did was I started over the, the next semester or two to sort of rewrite how I thought about that class and what, uh, what I needed to communicate and turned it into, as much as possible, project lectures where we'd leave the classroom or I'd bring a bunch of equipment into the classroom. I was teaching compositing and scene finishing, so we would do a lot of short effects. Uh, uh, a lot of my background's in visual effects work. So uh, we would do these little effects shoots, and we would actually perform the stuff with all of this equipment. Now, fortunately, I was at a place that, that uh, this facility had a tremendous amount of, you know, all the lighting and all the, you know, everything I could possibly want, any camera equipment and all this, anything I needed to bring in there, any extra computers, whatever I had access to. 
a tremendous amount of the world is not afforded that luxury of having anything they need at a moment's notice available for them to interact with and to, to present to students. You can't always take the students to the lab, to the observatory, to, to wherever, to, the, to the, the Amazon rainforest. You can't take, you know, these are places that are largely inaccessible. So you're watching them in slideshows and you're talking about them with a PowerPoint. And, uh, and I, I think the, the fact that we're now being enabled to provide these, these radically immersive technologies to educate at all levels. I, I think that's just the most spectacular and exciting thing. Skip? Well, you know, I, I have to go back to the definition to explain how I, I see VR applying. You know, I see education as any experience that has some effect or impact on brain behavior or thinking. Now, good education versus bad education might be the level of structure that's applied uh, to that experience. Now, certainly guided, I mean, uh, un, unbridled discovery is a, a good source of education, but if you have an objective that you want someone to learn, sometimes you have to apply structure. This is where I see VR as being especially compelling. Uh, we can build environments that we can put people in that they would never have access to or be very difficult, and we can systematically control what goes on in those environments and have it be reactive to the physical or cognitive um, activities of the person. So again, it, it comes down to meat and potatoes simulation technology, depending on what you want to teach or what you want someone to learn, you can structure a world that might be less structured on the onset, but as someone navigates it and maybe learns about animals or learns about science or STEM, STEAM education, um, you know, you have, I think good education though does require sort of a plan and sort of an objective, but a lot of creative ways, whether structured or less structured, uh, to help somebody get to that point. And VR by its just sheer nature of being the ultimate Skinner box, if you will, uh, allows, you know, affords us the tremendous opportunities. Uh, there's a, a new product that's out there that people should, might want to take a look at. It's called Happy Atoms, and Jesse Shell, who's done some really terrific work in the AR, mostly AR space, uh, is the developer of that. Um, Happy Atoms, and it also combines physical with digital, which I think is particularly relevant to kids. That and Osmo, which uh, is also using the pattern recognition capabilities of a current camera phone, so you don't need anything special to play either of these games. So Happy Atoms, for example, you're able to construct your own molecule. So you put them together any way you want. There are hundreds of different permutations and combinations. You use your phone then to identify what molecule you made, or if you're close to a molecule, how you can change it to make it into a real molecule. So you can create water by putting together your oxygen and hydrogen. Um, so that's a really interesting example where it's interactive, because a lot of these applications, you know, especially in the AR space in the beginning, they felt really gimmicky. It's like, oh, cute little animation comes off of my book, but really, you know, how engaging is that? So I'm also, like you, I'm looking for examples of really active learning and discovery. Uh, the Osmo product, which they have six different products, but the one the most recent one that came out is called Osmo Monster, and that's where you can draw your character and objects within the story and then you see them reflected in your story. And uh, that's, uh, that's a cute Christmas present for, I would say, a six-year-old. So those are my current two favorites with current technology. To expand a little bit on what Skip was saying earlier, you know, one thing that we find remarkably compelling about VR is the repeatability and the scalability of this technology. In a perfect world, a organization would take that one person that's the perfect master of that skill and they'd have them do one-on-one -on -one training hands-on with that person. Or in a perfect world, you'd be able to bring everybody from an organization all to a room where they'd be able to have the free experience of interacting and playing and self-discovery. And these things are remarkable, but there's this other challenge, especially within the corporate world, where you go, how do you educate 
three hundred thousand people and how do you make sure that they got that education and we're talking about structure how do we make sure that it's not just me getting a set of notes passed to me by steve and all of a sudden I'm taking an ethics class and I'm click 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 through it now all of a sudden with virtual reality we know who's in that space and we can track what their unique experience is and what silver thread tries to do is we do this unique hands-on experience which takes it out as the the wall street journal said a lot of 360 video kind of feels like you're in a fishbowl. So it's still going to short-term memory. It's just visual and audio. And all of a sudden when you're in there and you see your body interacting with something, it starts building long-term procedural memory because all of a sudden you're experiencing that skill and it'll never be a replacement of free exploration and it'll never be a replacement of hands-on with that person, but it can be a great augment so that the person could ramp up their skills and ramp up their knowledge base so that the time that they do have that might be a little more limited in some of these more interactive spaces can be that much more powerful and it can be more for polishing that skill set versus skill introduction. And so we think that the entire medium can shift the way that we as humans learn to get the best use of time with the best points because we don't want that perfect professor introducing the skill. We want somebody introducing those skills and building it up and then that perfect professor spending a one time to master that skill. See, so when you talk about education um, and, and VR and AR, are, uh, where do you think it's most likely to, to, to more fully develop first? Is it, is it in sort of corporate educational areas, um, some of which you were talking about, or maybe in, in the clinical medical side, like what you're focusing on, Skip, or, or really more in the edutain edutainment game space where you're actually you know, selling games to kids? Probably follow the money. <laughs> yeah. All of the above. <laughs> yeah. I mean, wherever um, you know, there's an urgency of a need and financial resources to support it. That's where we're going to see it. For example, did a lot of great work um, in cognitive assessment, but the market wasn't ready for it back in uh, 2003, 2004. But at the same time, there was an extreme urgency to address PTSD in service members. So consequently, the military, DoD was throwing dollars at advancing, you know, some of the more high-tech applications. But VR, of course, in, in our area, but also, you know, computerized prosthetics, um, you know, um, you know, battlefield medicine devices. Um, you know, war sucks, no doubt, but right. it always drives innovation because of the urgency of the need. So. The, you know, you have large agencies putting resources into development that subsequently cascades down to civilian life. Um, so it really is a, a you know, you've got to really look for where there's urgency and where there are resources uh, to support it. And that's going to govern. I think corporate, you know, I think when you can show a cost benefit that, you know, you can reduce training course costs and improve performance by using an automated but engaging process like VR, AR, whatever, mixed reality, um, that's where you'll see it grow. With kids, I mean, maybe you can get away with like Google Expeditions, you know, where, you know, the, the cardboard using a cell phone, and their motto is um, uh, Expeditions takes you where the school bus doesn't go, you know, and inspire kids. That's a low cost thing. Everybody's got a cell phone, um, cardboard, it's cheap. Um, so you'll see those things, but um, you know, so it's always, unfortunately, it's always about the money and the urgency. The other part to this is adoption, you know, saturation level. So the beauty is saturation level of this versus the first microwave. This had this logarithmic curve. Everyone had a smartphone in four and a half, five years. Everyone's seen this acceleration. What, what, if you go back five years, oh my God, that's the new guy. He has to have the new thing. Well, guess what? That's all of us today. Now, if you're like three months out of date, you're a Luddite. Before it says, hey, you're horse and buggy. So I think for us, we're extremely excited with where the industry is today, but especially excited where it's gonna be in three to five years, as we do have daydream type you know, standards built in, and so that we can truly say, the, the day that every schoolroom has competent, strong VR units already there as an install base, then we're all gonna be sprinting ahead. But today, when we're looking where the money is, where this confluence is, where the urgency and the needs are, for us, we're looking at closed ecosystems. Because I can go to a corporation and go, we can outfit you with 30 units you can take to multiple places and put them in a box versus trying to hit the entire market at once. So where do we survive? Where do we expand? 
So that's a good sequitur to talking about the evolution of technology and the different platforms that exist from a tech perspective. Um, Ariella, you started talking a little bit about Tango. Uh, where, where all do people think we are today in terms of uh, technology development in AR and VR? And, and what are some of the most exciting things you think are about to come on the horizon besides Tango? Uh, I, I like to think about the evolution of AR uh, because it's come relatively quickly and has, has allowed us to do all sorts of new types of interactions and game designs. When you think about, I know there are a lot of people here from Daiquiri. Uh, Daiquiri is an LA-based company and they do augmented reality. They have a technology platform and they're mostly geared to industry, which is where the money is at the moment, not anything close to K-12 for reasons of cost, for, re for uh, legitimate reasons about kids and eyesight, you know, visual cortex below the age of 13, you know, Oculus is saying no VR for kids. So, I mean, there, there are real reasons why uh, AR and VR are going to happen more slowly with the kids' market. Anyway, if you look at the technology, one of the first products Daiquiri came out with was something called Crayola Color Alive. I don't know if, you, if anyone is familiar with it. So that was really looking at targets. And we, had a, we actually have quite a few in K-12 schools, a lot of AR applications, a lot of AR companies devoted to creating applications based on your cell phone with a target and then seeing some type of animation that results. So that, that's been around for probably, I don't know, five years or so. We've seen those kinds of applications. And, Gradually, we get smarter and smarter about the world and what's in the world. So now the phone, now we're at the point of we've been able to recognize patterns. Think about Snapchat when we think about AR, right? Now we have object recognition. Think about Google Translate where we're actually using, it's a form of AR where we're recognizing letters and words and doing on-the-fly translation or star the, uh, what's Stargazer? Stargazer, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the, also using our GPS, they use accelerometers, and then superimpose uh, visuals on the real world. So uh, that's, that's sort of the trend line. Now we have a situation where Tango knows where the furniture is, HoloLens can even tell you that's a chair. They know that it's not just a physical object with these dimensions, but it actually knows what the object is. So imagine where all that is taking us. Um, so that's, that's you know, just becoming smarter about the real world and interacting in the real world with mobile devices um, is where I think it's going. The, the headsets that you know, we have now, um, Intel's back in the game with Allo. We have, all, obviously, Magic Leap, HoloLens, Meta. There are just a bunch of them. Daiquiri's headset. Uh, for me, they're really clunky and <laughs> heavy and uncomfortable. And our experience in our studio has been that people really like 10 to maximum 20-minute experiences. And then they're sort of done and for a time. And then they want to rest. I mean. I know there's probably a lot of controversy about that, but and so there, there are all those things on the horizon as well, but not terribly relevant to kids, in my opinion. I want to talk about something that really excites me about what can come from Project Tango and the technologies that wind up in your pocket, that wind up in everyone's pocket as a result. You know, when, when cell phones first started getting GPSs, uh, and everyone had them, and everyone was reporting that data in some way or another. We learned so much about the world that we live in. All of a sudden, you had Foursquare, and you could learn about places where people gathered. You could learn demographic data about you know, where people were spending their days, how they were traveling through a city, and, and just there was this explosion of information, useful information that came about when sensors that frankly had been around for 30 years, all of a sudden were in everybody's pocket. 
And that is going to happen again. Can I use your, your phone as a prop? Mine's on the floor. <laughs> when, when, when everyone has 3D cameras on their phones and they spend all day long walking around, scanning the furniture. Look, robots have been able to tell you what a chair was and what a cell phone is. They've been able to do that forever. But only robots could do that. And now your cell phone can do that. It's going to upload it to the cloud. It's going to, it's going to be synchronized with everybody else's data about what the world look like, looks like. And all of a sudden, we are collectively going to build the most amazing, magical map of the world that we inhabit. Machine learning algorithms, which have been getting incredible in the last four years, are going to synthesize this data into uh, the world's best video game map. Holy cow. It's going to be incredible. And maybe you won't necessarily interact with that world through the medium of pixels. You won't necessarily have AR goggles or VR goggles. You know, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's audio. Who knows what it is? But to have that level of understanding about the world that we all live in, uh, it just, that, that prospect just feel, fills me with great glee. We are going to have some amazing experiences in a world where computers can just picture any part of it at any time. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, I, I feel like a lot of times it takes um, an app or a device to really break open uh, technology that's been around for a while. Um, and so Pokemon Go, as we see, because a lot of people here in this audience play it, uh, that's been, in my mind, sort of a groundbreaking catalyst for virtual reality and, and augmented reality in terms of bringing it to the masses. What did, what is what do you have an opinion as to what its contribution has been so far? Uh, what Pokemon Go's contribution yeah. has been mm -hmm. so far? Well, uh, it has filled me with great jealousy. I built an <laughs> app very similar to that many, many years ago before it was ready. And nobody really wanted to leave their houses and go out and search for Neos. That's, we, that's what we, I was going out for. We, we should compare notes I on our 2008 lot, era. I think a lot of us have this story, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's gotten people comfortable with the idea that the world is their, is their game board. You know, in a way that, that no one was really thinking that way before. Like, Foursquare was an early attempt at gamify, gamifying the world. Yeah. And uh, Pokemon goes, no, 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 screw the gamifying. It's just a game, right? The whole world can just be a game. You don't need to, it's, it's different. So I think people are, are, are seeing that now, and that's great. But this isn't a Pokemon Go. Uh, no, it's not. And I don't want to get off. bogged down in it, but I was just <laughs> curious since we are talking about VR and AR. The, the degree to which just it's elevated uh, public awareness of, uh, of additional capabilities uh, of the mobile devices they're carrying around in their pockets. I, I think it's something that, uh, you know, even people that were aware that, oh, there's this thing, I saw this thing about, uh, about HoloLens, or I saw this thing about whatever, and uh, to realize, well, there's actually some of this that, that's actually super practical. That's, that's really easy to pull off with existing technology. So these things don't seem like, it's like, yeah, the HoloLens is $3,000 for a developer kit, and that, that means that nobody's going to buy this thing for anything other than corporate use or because you're a, a gigantic nerd with money to burn. But, oh. uh, <laughs> but, but by grounding it in something that they're like, oh, yeah, I played it, you know, my friend was playing, and I downloaded it, and now I run around and I chase these things. And, and to realize that this is actually something that, uh, you know, that, that's this acceptable technologically. And of course it's open the dialogue. People actually know what, have some kind of idea at least, even if it's uh, not necessarily what we, you know, in, in the technical capacity, what we'd want to promote as augmented or mixed reality. It's at least sort of an introduction for a lot of people beyond what they would have likely had for several more years. I think one of my favorites was there was a Jimmy Kimmel episode not that long ago that was celebrating Back to the Future, the big anniversary, and they've got a, the doctor, he comes out and he goes, oh my God, you guys have had supercomputers in your pockets? What are you doing with them? Are you solving world peace? What's going on? And they go, no, we're playing Candy Crush. <laughs> and the yeah. beauty to me is VR and AR is all of a sudden this way where we can use these supercomputers and we can really, we're, we're pushing them to their max again. And it's not just for Excel tables, but all of a sudden we can instill this sense of wonder and we can transport people and we can, you know, we can have children wanting to save the animals because not only did they watch a little video on the front of the screen up there and it was remote, I couldn't touch it, but all of a sudden they are directly interacting with it or they're walking through the jungle firsthand. They're there actually right. doing this. And it's that sense of going, let's do more than just Candy Crush. Let's have our kids chase zombies and interact and run around the world that all of a sudden it's this tipping point where I think it's getting really fun again. I also yeah. think that it made 
the world, it, it, gave, it gave us a game that made the world smaller. And I think that when living in this global age now, the, where the, every product that can make the world smaller, where we're, we are really connected to what's happening in, te in Kenya, or what's happening, in, and that, that can, they can play this game all over the world, and that, uh, that every time we start realizing that we, our planet is pretty small, and uh, that we're all connected, and what happens in America affects the people in the Pacific Islands, because their islands are now going underwater, because by what we have been doing here with our gasoline and our industry. So I think that as we start to realize how small a planet we are, that we, uh, and I think this game really helped us do that in that we could say, oh, they're playing Pokemon in Japan, and they're playing Pokemon in uh, England. And so suddenly you realize that our planet is, we can location base our entire planet and interact with it. And I think that is really a profound step in making the change. So data and analytics are, are always part of any uh, widespread technology adoption. Where do you think we are today in terms of data and analytics in these areas? You know, what's the most common type of information people are getting out of it, and, and what are the challenges to move things forward? Well, one of the things that's, uh, that, of course, is we've talked about how things kind of first gravitate towards where the, the most obvious money is. Uh, there's a couple of companies right now that are doing uh, basically uh, gaze tracking and developing uh, heat maps for experiences so you can determine where people were looking. Uh, there's also a lot of, uh, uh, for inside of a, a larger, you know, more mobile experience, that you can develop the same kinds of heat maps for where people go in an area. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to determine like what sort of paths people are taking naturally, what sort of things they're paying attention to during an experience, like actually where they're looking. You know, this is something that I remember, you know, I, I was a, a psychology and philosophy major, God, how, 25 years ago now? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's like we, we had stuff that we did then for, for measuring, like, where a person was looking to, to determine, like, what parts of a picture they would pay attention to. And this was a technology that you had to have, like, custom equipment that you built. You couldn't even order this somewhere. And now this is something that everybody wearing any kind of VR headset we automatically have this information if we care to collect it. We know exactly what they're looking at. We know exactly how much time they spend paying attention to different parts of the scene. Where, as a story unfolds in front of them, where their eye tends to be drawn. You know, we, we don't have to guess at it. We don't have to equip them with some kind of special additional sensor. This is just information that we have. And I think the future, the, the potential for that outside beyond beyond advertising beyond you know being able to bill an advertiser because oh they looked at your ad and we know they paid attention to it for three seconds <laughs> you know beyond that knowing whether you're effectively communicating you know something in an educational experience uh, when you're telling when you're when you're going through and, and presenting a narrative you know how effectively you've you've drawn their attention to important parts of that narrative I think this is gigantic yeah I think the, um, I think the uh, Automatic sensing and inference of human behavior um, is going to be a big area. You know, we've been doing some stuff where people interact with a virtual agent, and with a simple webcam, we can track facial expression, uh, body posture, gesture, um, analyze vocal prosody, not so much what someone says, but how someone says it. And by doing that, and doing it with large numbers of people that are in known groups, people with depression, people with anxiety, um, healthy controls, however many of them, those exist, <laughs> um, we can start to pick up a window into the soul. Now, it could be dangerous. You know, you think about lie detection. You think about other intrusive kinds of things. But Marshall, for a useful purpose, we can start to aid in diagnostics. We can start to quantify human behavior in ways that might be predictive that this person might be on the verge of suicide or this person is going through a depression and needs a little extra support at a time. And by doing this, psychology's always kind of had a little flirtation with 
this kind of dust bowl empirical analysis, the MMPI, I don't know how many psychologists are out there, but you know, asking you 560 questions, true, false, and by giving these questions to people with schizophrenia or major depression or bipolar and healthy controls, all of a sudden you can pick out that somebody that uh, endorses, yes, I like mechanics magazines. Well, that's one notch towards the paranoid schizophrenia scale. Uh, <laughs> it actually is. 95% uh, of paranoid schizophrenics said, I like mechanics uh -oh. magazines. 95% of healthy controls said no. Um, but that kind of a, a thing, and people have used those kind of measures, but they always seem cold because it's not developed as you know an insightful understanding of a human. But actually, humans leak behavior all the time that is a window into what they're feeling. So if we can start to use big data to understand that, with the caveat about not invading people's privacy and using it for a good purpose, then we might be able to advance mental health, medical, educational applications, and so on. That's a really interesting point, that, that uh, with that much data, and by applying sort of modern machine learning and neural networks, you can get that window into a soul that you couldn't get with a 561 question questionnaire. The volume of data that just streams out of the devices that we wear on our bodies and put on our eyes and, and interact with all day uh, just provides such, such, such immense amounts of data. What, what, do you, what do you regress on? What do you classify on is the question. Yeah. Paranoid schizophrenics, is a, it's a good way to start, I think. Yeah. Good place to start. Uh, we're actually working with an international research agency that wants to test what's known as executive function in preschoolers, and they want to use the Tango to do that. Because previously, you're just looking at a, you know, some type of obviously graphically oriented test on a screen. You know, and you're trying to test, you know, the degree of planfulness, for example, in a child. Well, now, if you can put it in the context of a game and then actually watch where the child moves in the environment in order to make these same kinds of assessments, they're going to be more valid and more reliable assessments than paper and pencil. So back to what you were, you had mentioned that earlier, that was something that, uh, you know, testing is a very big business <laughs> in this country and around the world. So if we can actually learn how to use these tools to do these kinds of assessments in a way that's just more uh, organic, you know, then I think we'll get more valid tests. There's another part to this as well, which is customized learning modules. So if we look, uh, we were talking with the president of a university the other day, and he said that he sees the future of education, especially the federal funding of education, being more and more, uh, being driven away from the classic model of did you take these units, did you do these standardized tests, where are you, and more to skill-based competency. If we're talking to a Unity program, I don't care where you went to school. Can you do this? Do you have these core skills? And what's unique about VR, because of the constant data that's being poured back, it's the very nature of it, we're tracking everywhere you're looking and what you're doing, how you're engaging with this medium, that's never been possible before. So the intrinsic value of VR or AR as a medium is the fact that we have this feedback loop. And as such, we can go ahead and measure, if we're putting somebody through an experience, if we measure and we say they were engaged in that experience, they're ready to move on to the next lesson, or you know what, they weren't paying attention to the right moment. Let's go through and send them through this other channel to give them some remedial training to reinforce that last lesson. And it's the very nature of this medium that allows that to occur, which is really exciting. You know, let me just add one little piece. You know, imagine, um, you know, you've got a child working on a computer with a, a virtual human tutor that they've selected that appeals to them and engages them and is non-threatening. And as the tutor is teaching the child, you know, some kind of a math problem, the sensors can pick up when the child's frustrated or when they're distracted and looking away. Instead of yelling at the kid, you know, like my teachers did all my life in, in grade school, um, you know, teachers say, hey, you know, it looks like this is frustrating for you. Let me show you another way of doing it. Or let's play this little game that might illustrate this concept. And so that bi-directional interaction, that sensing of the, the child's state may be something that could be useful to the point where the child, instead of 
not understanding something but being too afraid to raise their hand and ask a dumb question because they'll be socially ridiculed by a teacher or their peers. Instead, they can interact with a, a virtual agent that you, they feel safe. And, and our research thus far has shown that, that people do feel very safe. They reveal more personal, they self-disclose more personal information, more events of past sadness when they're interacting with an AI agent than when they're interacting with a real person or even a person that they know is driving the character avatar style in the back room. So I think, you know, the, 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 the stimuli we presented, VR, AR, mixed reality type things, that's all good, but sensing, you know, the user in a way that makes that, that dynamic delivery of content or that socially facilitating response, I think is really where we're gonna see a lot of advances um, in education. So we could easily uh, discuss many more topics, but I do want to leave a few minutes for questions. Does anyone in the audience have a question? This gentleman right here. I think nowadays you would need some empirical way of determining in your particular domain what constitutes from fun from your perspective <laughs> and uh, I don't know, stick them in an fMRI machine and uh, <laughs> find that part of the brain which glows when people are having a good time as compared with eating ice cream for example, I don't know. And then you just have, to, I mean, I'd build a neural network to you know, just classify data. You just gotta, if you've got tons of data, there's gonna be a correlation in there somewhere. Right. Uh, you know, you brought up a real challenge, right? What What is ground truth? Is it a self-report rating? Um, is it you know some you know later measure of learning or something? Uh, it's really hard uh, to do that. You know, in some of the stuff we've done, we have a virtual character that asks open-ended questions like. When was the last time you felt really happy? And you reliably see somebody that's in a state of psychological distress, perhaps a homeless veteran. We've tested literally eight or 900 people in these categories. And you reliably see them look down, they pause for a second, um, they hem and haw, their voice gets flat. These are all things that if you know that person, in the first millisecond, you can tell that they're they're not feeling so good. Um, but with strangers, the software does a better job of it because we've developed these, these analytics of patterns. There's a piece of software called Multisense, which we can talk about after, um, that we make available for these kinds of things. But it takes running hundreds and hundreds of known groups, and this is in the mental health area. Now, the challenge of whether someone's paying attention um, you got to do a probe. You got to pop something out there and see how quick they respond or if their eyes light up. Um, sometimes you got to go back and forth with it, but it takes literally hundreds of, of people. I think it must also be difficult because what if somebody's idea of having fun is being chased by zombies and getting their arm chopped off or something like that? I don't know. Uh, the woman right here? No, you? Well, I'll, I'll start the answer there. Uh, so our game is for six and up. Uh, I didn't want to do anything younger because we all have remember our imaginary friends as children and the ability to tell a difference between something that's real and not real. You know, most kids between the ages of three and four, they have that mastered. 
uh, pretty well, so, uh, but I didn't want to get into that. I would also say that there are issues with kids under six, even six, seven-year-olds holding the device. You have to hold it. It's a little bit heavier and bigger than the normal phone. They get tired of holding it, and their little fingers cover up the 3D cameras in the back, and that makes it not work so well, you know, when their fingers are there. So we actually had to design our game so that it worked in portrait and landscape mode because of the way they held their fingers. So all kinds of, I have on, on my blog website, ariellalaire.com, I have some really funny pictures of kids in their corners. You know, they get stuck in their corner trying to chase the uh, zombie. So there are issues uh, like that, and I don't rec I recommend this type of gameplay for under six or school age. Uh, in terms of memory for virtual items, I am absolutely fascinated by this, and I have been trying to get some of my friends back in academia to do some research on this. So, for example, as part of our game, you, you might have special zombies who show up, like the ballerina, and, you, and after you color her, then she's here with a big question mark. She wants something. So then you have to search the room to find a treasure chest, and there are treasure chests all over, and one of those treasure chests has a pair of ballet slippers or something else she wants. You take that over to her, and she does a happy dance if you happen to bring the, the right thing to her. Now, the memory for the, the child's memory of where those ballet slippers are, which of those treasure chests, I don't think it's quite the same as your memory for a real item. So virtual items versus real items. But that's something we're going to have to do research on. I don't know if anybody else has any other experiences with that. Um, so I don't think they necessarily remember <coughs> virtual items the same way they do physical items. But I don't know. And I don't know relevant research on it. Uh, that I, I believe at the age range that we're dealing with that they understand that these are virtual items and they're not real. I believe that. So to expand on this slightly, we specialize in recording memories. You know, if we fast forward 10 years from now or 15 years from now, we all want to be in the full holodeck where what's created in CGI is just as realistic as the real world. Today it's very hard to do that, to really cross the uncanny valley with CPU power, you know, GPU power. So we've turned to recording the real world, but we record it in full stereo and record it in a body, and we record this at extremely high resolution that can't even play back yet. And so because of this, we have this simulacrum experience that someone can go back and watch a memory. And in the case of children, it's very unique. Uh, one of our earliest experiences, we we're completely done with prototype well, 10 or 11, and I said, that's it, I'm getting out of the lab. And I took the camera, I went and picked up my son, and we went hiking, and it worked. And I have a memory captured in full stereo in my body of hiking with my son up a mountain, him climbing up, and then I pick him up and hold him up. And the wild part about it is my son has the memory of being there with his dad, but he also has the memory, because he's experienced it multiple times, of being in my body hiking with himself. And you start to shift things. And we have, we have stuff, we have an experience where you're feeding baby lemurs. And I've heard my daughter mistakenly refer to it a couple times amongst her friends that, oh, yeah, she's handled baby lemurs. And she knows the cognitive difference. I mean, if you question her, of course she can tell you which one's which. We're not at that point yet. But I think the day, and I can't remember who said it, but somebody said, if we fast forward 15 years from the future, at some point we're going to have kids go, hey, Dad, you remember when we went to Disneyland? And you're going to say, we never went to Disneyland. And he goes, oh, yeah, I forgot that was, that was a virtual experience. So that will occur, and I think now we've got to start putting on the ethical hat and saying, yeah. does it matter? In, in the case of some things, I would say that's a positive. I want my kids to experience endangered animals firsthand because they're going to call awareness to it. At the same time, my son is playing certain games he probably shouldn't be playing as a young kid, and maybe I don't want him developing PTSD. So, so where do we draw these boundaries as creators and as inventors and how do we help guide these principles? Because we are playing with some really powerful technology now. Yeah. So now you've created the topic for the next panel. I think we've, I think we've run out of time. No way. No, we have two <laughs> till 2.15. Oh, OK. Oh, you're right. OK, sorry. <laughs> uh, this woman right here.
good one. <laughs> Always take a crack. What are you educating them about? A sort of a, a maybe a, a throwaway comment here, but uh, when we were talking about getting sensors attached to kids and see how well they learn, I had an image of a teacher standing up in front of a, a, a group of kids wearing AR goggles and seeing everyone's relative attention levels, and it terrified me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other side of this is there's. Let's all face this. Being up on stage in front of an audience is a real thing, and they've done a lot of these elements. My wife's a teacher. The way you go through schooling is you go to virtual classrooms where you've got other students acting as students. Well, all of a sudden, in my case, my, my wife specializes in high-functioning special needs, so autism, these brilliant kids. It's something I could never do. I would love to be able to watch what she does for a day before I was put in that scenario. Mm -hmm. So it's once again, it's the ability to safely go there, yeah. come back out, and then discuss it with a real person or an AI person mm -hmm. before you go and before you accelerate their training. So same thing you do for any job. Yeah, just bringing off of uh, my, my earlier comments about how I learned when I started lecturing, how much I hated traditional, doing traditional lecturing. Um, having been able to potentially uh, pre-experience that and to realize what didn't work for me, to realize how bored I was talking from a, a pre-prepared kind of thing. And, uh, it, you know, I, I, I know that the first few classes I had got just crap, crap education from me <laughs> because I was so bad at it until I learned what worked for me. And uh, I, I think having you know potentially that experience to to actually stand up there and try to do it and realize no this doesn't work, and uh, maybe even to have you know some level of of simulated AI for the students so that you kind of get an idea of is this working? Am I actually engaging people enough? Am I making eye contact with enough people? Am I am I actually reaching out and, and talking to specific people enough? I, I think that that would be a tremendous thing for educators to be able to experience. In a, in a way that doesn't actually destroy a whole classroom experience. <laughs> so we had a question from a woman in the blue shirt there and then this gentleman in the back. It's amazing stuff. The, if we look at the way we learn, we, we go back to papyrus. The invention of the written page is huge. All of a sudden you can disseminate knowledge. At a certain point, it's what do you do in the scenario? And in a perfect world, you'd go through that scenario safely with an educator at your side coaching you along the way. That's not necessarily scalable. It's not necessarily repeatable, uh, especially larger things. We're doing something where we're doing a, um, a mass casualty response scenario where you've got 200 plus actors involved and fire trucks and ambulances, and it's the pandemonium of the experience. And nothing's gonna replace actually going through that simulation, which they do once a year at the college. But the difference is we're gonna be able to capture all this different curriculum within these pieces. You're gonna be able to experience it from different roles. Because if I go and actually do that curriculum, I'm gonna have one role. I'm gonna either be the EMT that day or the victim that day, and that was my one chance at it. Well now in VR, I can experience all the roles and because you can experience all these different roles, it changes your perspective, and then in turn, it changes your engagement with the simulation when you actually go through it. This gentleman. Do you remember back in the early days of the internet, it was supposed to bring everybody together and solve common problems, but we really wanted a better price on shoes, right? <laughs> You know, I, 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 what I started in television, and we, I developed a show called, with producers called Big Blue Marble. And uh, it was the, fir was the first show to be a global television show and feature kids all over the world. And nowadays, I, uh, there's a 
Facebook, a couple of Facebook pages. Everybody's looking for their pen pal that they found when they were a kid. They're, they're adults now, and they want to find this person. And I, I think that we as developers need to think about not just collecting data, but facilitating people finding each other. And that you know that that people are have want to have that connection, social connection. They don't want to be manipulated for their data. They want to be, and I think as developers, you have a responsibility to understand why people are uh, participating in social experiences or in, in learning about. Any, any environment, learning about animals, learning about other countries, that people want to connect socially, to make friends, to learn about other cultures, and that we have that responsibility to help facilitate that, rather than to be collecting, manipulating our audience to get data about them. So I think it's a moral, ethical issue that I think you're bringing up is what are we doing with the data? Are we helping our audience or are we gathering data about them? Are we them? spying on them? Right. <laughs> I think the sad truth is that just about anybody on the internet would trade all their neuroscience data for a cheaper price on shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Or the other side of this is the price of the shoes is what will drive the internet's creation and in turn the creation of our world. Yeah. <laughs> well, people need to be responsible and in charge of their own data, in my opinion. Right. So we need to own our own data, and then we can decide how we want to sell it, how we want to benefit from it, if we want to distribute it. So we're not at that point yet, but I mean, there are a lot of really smart people talking about that. I've, I've heard Google ethicists, you know, giving speeches yeah. on the subject. So yeah. they're, uh, you people know, are thinking about it. the people are th beginning to think about it. And there's. Yeah. There's an international standards board, IEEE, that's looking at this precisely. I spoke yeah. on a panel in San Jose where one of the core elements was ethics and VR. Who owns this data, what you do with it? Mm -hmm. And I think the key thing, nefarious action versus altruistic action, is you choose your own action. So if you're yeah. one of the guys working towards a good cause, get more people to work with you. You know, there's one thing, and you cued it off when you're talking about people wanting to be connected. And, you know, think back and before you know, we were really were connected with the internet back in the 90s with um, this little show called Star Trek Next Generation. And uh, they came up with the, the Borg. They were the bad guys, the hive mind, the collective, the right, people that right. were constantly connected. And if you pulled a Borg away, they freaked out because they, were, they weren't connected anymore. And that's what happens when you lose your cell phone yeah. or your internet's down, you know? So maybe the Borg, is what we're aspiring to, but we have to be yeah. really careful about that. Yeah. That's yeah. well <laughs> Another question? I have uh, one more, because we have a few minutes. And um, I wanted to ask, where do people think the money's going to be made? Hardware, software, services, apps, games. And I'll put a time frame on it. In the next three years, where do you think the most money is going to be made? Well, you know, I think Samsung thought they were going to be making a lot of money on this until their phone burnt up. Yeah. And uh, now they, <laughs> and, now, and you know, I love Samsung because we've been developing on the Samsung um, phone and the Samsung VR, and I, they were an early uh, hardware adapter for a simple interface uh, with a simple little plastic headset that you could put your phone in. And I think it's really sad that this happened to Samsung. But I think that their phone is still, like our panelists have been saying, is still where the early adapters have now become the mainstream. And I still believe that the Google so you is think hardware? with it now. That it's ha hardware devices in the next few years? Well, I think the hardware will still be the phone. That's what I believe. Anyone else? I, I think it'll be analytics and advertising. In that mm -hmm. time frame, you won't have enough time for hardware manufacturers to get enough devices into people's hands. Yeah. At the same time, YouTube will be putting out free content and sending people little pieces of cardboard in the mail. Uh, people will watch these videos. 
and advertisers and people who are interested in analytics will learn a huge amount about user behavior. And then the money will start to get made when they can drive headset manufacturing and apps and services and all that stuff. But in, that, in the time frame you mentioned, mm. it's definitely advertising. I had lunch on Friday with a VC who said, loves the Tango platform, the Tango type of capability, and is looking to place bets on the application layer relating to mapping and wayfinding. It was something that you were saying before about how we're mapping all the interiors now of the airports and buildings and shopping malls and so creating uh, an application layer so that people can add their content to the 3D camera technology. I, that was what the VC told me, so <laughs> passing that on. Yeah, no, that's interesting because the only thing I would say about advertising is I used to think Foursquare was great too and I Foursquared all the time and then they ruined it because they weren't making money. They couldn't make enough money out of advertising, and so then they turned it into Swarm, and, and anyway. And, and made all the money on analytics. Yeah. So. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming today, and let's give a round of applause for our panel.